Okay, you're good to go. Have a good session. Hey, thank you. Uh, welcome to the session of quantum algorithms. And this session will be moderated by Masayuki Abi and, and me. My name is Yuyu. And the first talk is uh, estimating quantum speedups for lattice sieves by Martin Albert. Albert uh, Valid Gogil, Amon Postlewait, and John Shank. I'm not sure how many mistakes I made in pronouncing these names, but uh, <laughs> that's my best you, try. You got mine right, so. Yeah. Uh, Amon will do the talk. All right, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, in this work, what we're trying to do is look at these algorithms called lattices, and in particular, their quantum variants, and say, in a given dimension, what cost do they have, rather than just looking at the asymptotic cost. So um, very briefly, lattices are algorithms that take as input a lattice, they output short vectors in those lattices, and they have time and space complexity, which is exponential in the dimension of the lattice they consider. Okay, and if you really mine right down into the detail, Ultimately, the problem that you're considering is some sort of nearest neighbor search routine on a sphere. So imagine you're in some high dimension, you have a unit sphere, and it's got all of these points on the surface. These are somehow your vectors. And you're trying to find pairs of these vectors whose difference is uh, length one or shorter. And because you're on a sphere, this is exactly the condition that their inner product is greater than some value. So that's the inner product condition on the bottom of this slide. <clears throat> Now, to move this into the world of sort of um, quantum search procedures, et cetera, we consider in our work this problem as a, as, a, as a search predicate with a filter. And while I'm going to talk about it in sort of generality, the thing to keep in mind is that your search predicate encodes this inner product condition on the bottom of this slide. So <clears throat> what's the search predicate for us? It's some function from, say, the integers 1 to n to 0 and 1. We say it's got roots, uh, which are the values which it evaluates to zero on, and we call its kernel the collection of all of these roots. And these roots are the things we're trying to find. So in the classical world, you can try and find a root by simply evaluating this function f1, f2, f3, and so on. And in the quantum world, you could, for example, think about using a search algorithm like Grover's. So that's uh, very succinctly summed up by this expression d of zero is an equal quantum superposition of the elements one to n. g of f is some circuit that encodes your predicate f and you apply it j times. And, right, and the magic asymptotically of Grover's algorithm is that it tells you that this j is of the order of square root n rather than the order of n, which is the number of times you expect to evaluate f classically. But of course, when you're not thinking about the asymptotic world, you sort of care about the relative costs of f in the classical world and g of f in the quantum world. So if f is expensive, you might want to use a filter, which is some second predicate that shares at least one root with f. And then instead of the previous thing, f1, f2, f3 in the classical world, you can search the domain with your filter and only try that element of the domain with f if your filter has a root. So, you know, F1 only if G1 is zero, for example. And this filtering procedure might be a good idea if G is particularly cheap. Uh, and if these two quantities, the false positive and the false negative rate of G are as close to zero as possible. So uh, just to take a second, the false positive rate of G, this is gonna be exactly zero when all of the roots of G are also roots of F which means in this search procedure above, every time you evaluate f, you're gonna find a root of f. But this is a classical thing. Um, what we actually do in our work is we design a similar filtered quantum search routine. That kind of conditional branching is not so easy in the quantum world, but that's one of the um, contributions of our work. We examine a filter that's commonly used in lattices, which is called pop count or XOR and pop count and we build an optimized quantum circuit for it. We give an analysis of its false positive and negative rates, and then uh, consider a number of quantum cost metrics that come from various different assumptions on quantum memory you're willing to make. And finally, we produce some software that optimizes a given lattice sieve in a given dimension with respect 
to all of the above bullet points and ultimately spits out a cost for sieving in that dimension in a given metric. And so just to very briefly talk about some results, um, the quantum metric here is something we're calling Gidney Ecker 19, and it's adapted from a recent work on surface codes, which is a way of allowing arbitrarily long quantum computations. And the final column here is the log of what the asymptotics would tell you the quantum advantage of these various, of the particular lattice if we consider is. So for example, in dimension 312, you'd expect a quantum advantage of about two to the eight, but you know, our optimized estimates suggest that this is actually where the classical and quantum variants of this algorithm overlap in terms of their complexity. And then we consider, for example, the cryptanalytically interesting time complexities, something like two to the 128 to two to the 256, and consider what quantum advantages exist within that range. And also you can do things like, instead of restricting time, restrict to memory, and see what kind of quantum advantages you can obtain when you restrict memory instead. So this is just like a very brief precy of one of the results of our work. Um, and our analysis on our figures are ultimately estimates. And we do believe that if it was a more perfect or comprehensive analysis, then the quantum advantage of these particular lattice sieves would probably shrink even further. And just to give one quick example as to why, um, we cost quantum RAM and RAM as having the same um, cost, so unit cost, and quantum RAM being the operation of querying an entire memory and receiving a uniform superposition over that memory, or as RAM being the act of just querying a single register in that memory. And uh, most research suggests that, for example, QRAM will be far more expensive. So uh, in this work, we tried to look past the asymptote costs of certain algorithms which are very useful for cryptanalysis and for concretely costing a lot of lattice-based cryptography and we found that uh, the quantum advantage seems to be much less than the asymptotics would suggest. So thanks for listening and I'll happily take your questions. Okay, there's a, there's a question in the chat but uh, not a, which is not a specific to your talk. Okay. About uh, non, uh, near collision binding algorithm, but that seems uh, already been answered by another, another. I think I'm not the person to answer that oh, yeah, question, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do we have uh, any questions? And then, uh, sorry, I, let me see. How about the lattices with spe special structures like ideal lattices or module lattices? Can you mention um, also work? Can, you, can your method also work? Um, so, when considering these kind of lattices in lattice sieves, the, um, my understanding is that the, the kind of best speed up that you get is simply by considering all of the, say, rotations of these lattice vectors, and it allows you to use less space um, and compare lattice vectors within your sieving procedure more efficiently. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, these methods could be applied to such speed ups within uh, sieves for ideal lattices, but uh, we're really trying to abstract away any of the details of the particular um, sieving procedure and just look at this nearest neighbor search on the sphere, because whether you're doing sieves in unstructured lattices or algebraic lattices, or you know, like no matter what type of machinery you build on top, all of these sieves have to, uh, at some point, solve nearest neighbor search on the sphere. So we didn't do it in this work, but yes, you could take our work and apply these kinds of um, linear improvements that you get for ideal lattices and uh, you would get cost estimates out. Yeah. But we haven't done that. Thank you. There was also a question by a couple of questions by Summer saying that uh, from the figure of the relationship between the complexity and the dimension D in the paper, why there is a gap between your experiment and the theoretical analysis? Uh, yeah. All right, so um, I think he's referring to the fact that the dashed lines are the asymptotic costs and then above it in the figures are solid lines, which are, yes, the um, optimized costs. Um, it's because um, if you took large enough D, those lines should converge, but the asymptotics that are produced from the theoretical analysis are 
sort of uh, you, you know you have to you have to suppress lots of sub exponential factors to get to them, and it's simply a matter of the size of the instance. Um, I think. Uh, for example, if you, no, I won't say anything further. I think that's the reason. But uh, as I say, you can feel free to email me if, uh, if I don't manage to answer your questions. Thank you. And the, the other question is, what is your view about the prospect of lattice sieving algorithm and other attacking algorithms to the lattice space, a uh, lattice problem such as SVP? Oh, my view? Um, yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think it's a very interesting and active area of research. It seems to currently be the case for experimental um, results that we can actually, you know, produce that lattice sieves uh, appear to be the most efficient way of finding these short vectors. Um, but there have also been really recent and exciting progress in other algorithms like enumeration, etc. I think. Uh, I think conservatism is sort of the key word of the day. And so provided you're using what's currently understood to be the best solver of SVP, I think nobody could ask you to do more than that. Um, I don't know, there's, <clears throat> there's certainly interesting work in the pipeline about distributed lattice sieving and people have been talking about hardware implementations that remove some of the bottlenecks for a long time. So it would be very interesting to see any of those things actually come to light is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thanks. Abby, uh, Abby, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Um, we move to the second talk, which is uh, whose title is "A Combinatorial Approach to Quantum Random Functions" by Nico Dutring, Julio Marabolta, and Shihan Pu. So Shihan is the speaker. Hello. Um, Hello. Thanks for introduction. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sihan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. 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 Um, oh, all right. Uh, this talk is about a uh, combinatorial approach to quantum random function. Uh, it's joint work with uh, Nico Dutton and Julio Marabota. So let me first recall what's a pseudo random function. Um, a pseudo random function, which is a deterministic function uh, behaving randomly, which means uh, it's indistinguishable from true random function for any polynomial distinguisher under black box SS. Um, and also we require this PRF to be uh, computed efficiently. It has, um, it's a fundamental building block in modern crypto constructions. So what about the PRF analogs in quantum world? Uh, in general, there are two definitions. The first one is um, post-quantum PRF. Uh, some authors will name it as a standard, uh, standard secure PRF for quantum adversaries, which means uh, even the distinguisher can, can evaluate quantum circuits locally, uh, but he can only send classical queries to the Oracle. Uh, the other definition, or what we focus on in this work is quantum secure PRF, or QPRF, which means, uh, this which means the distinguisher can send quantum queries. Uh, it can query, uh, it, it can query via superpositions. Uh, here, superposition simply means uh, you can query all of your uh, linear combinations of all your possible inputs. So, uh, then we did a, did a lot of work in this area, in, especially in Fox 2012 and Crypto 2012. It gave a separation result uh, that uh, there exists some post quantum PRF which are not quantum secure. And he also proved that many constructions of post quantum PRF are quantum secure. But he used, um, he used completely different analysis for each one. And those proofs are, are somewhat complicated and not tied. So uh, this motivated us to think is there a generic, generic construction for quantum secure PRF? with a simple analysis and a tight proof. Our inspiration is from domain extension techniques. However, that's a challenge that uh, 
That means it's not trivial to extend the domain even for a truly random function because of via uh, superposition queries, one can detect the hidden linear structure of a function efficiently. This would leak um, way more information compared in, in classical case. So we explore a different role to construct QPRF, which is based on the framework of drilling and shoulder in Kudo 2015 and have the following result. They given any post quantum PRF with small domain. Here small domain is just a polynomial size domain. Our construction can extend it to a full-fledged quantum secure PRF uh, on a, a large domain, exponentially large, exponentially large size. So our key ingredient here is a highly unbalanced bipartite expander, which has constructions in GOV09. It crucially allows us to reduce the quantum harness to classical harness of the underlying small domain PRF, which make our, um, makes our analysis almost classical. Here's um, an outline of our constructions. Uh, so basically there are two steps. The first step is a domain extension step and the second step is a combiner step. Uh, in the first step, in the domain extension step, uh, it takes a small domain PRF with, uh, with polysized domain and it constructs from it to a uh, Q-bonded uh, quantum secure PRF on a large domain. Uh, Q-bonded PRF is simply um, it, it simply means uh, its security is only guaranteed if, uh, if its adversary can, can send Q queries at most. On minor step, it combines a small number of bounded functions with the same domain to make an unbounded QPRF. Uh, here's a, a high level description of our scheme. Since the first step, since the domain extension part is more uh, interesting and more challenging, I'd like to give some Intuition behind this step. So first we extend a truly random function uh, to a small, uh, with a small domain, a two kilowatts independent function on a large domain. Uh, here kilowatts independent simply means uh, for any pair of watts destined x1 to x key, uh, we would not need this uh, gen x1 to gen x key are independent and uniformly random. During this extension, we use a, a highly unbalanced bipartite expander we mentioned before. Then we're gonna replace this uh, small domain random function with a small domain post quantum PRF. And we argue that this replacement is, indistingu is indistinguishable for any Q bonded BQP distinguisher. Finally, by using um, Zandrius Lemma in Fox 2012, this directly implies that uh, a two kilowatts independent function behaves identically to a random function and a Q-bonded adversary. So far we got a Q-bonded quantum secure PRF, then we use combined step to make it um, unbounded. So in summary, uh, we give a generic construction for quantum secure PRF, which has simple analysis, uh, almost an almost classical analysis and an optimal type proof. That's all and thanks for your attention. Thanks for interesting talk. Any questions from the audiences? I don't see any on the chat. Sorry? The, uh, yeah, I, I don't see any. Okay. okay, so, well, I have one, one question about the expander, uh, bipartite expander um, object. Is that our, uh, is the choice of that expander graph a private or completely public? Uh, you mean the, this, this uh, expander structure is, is yes. totally public? Yeah. Okay. Then, it's, then, it's just a, it, yeah, it's a graph. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then uh, the next question would be how much overhead it will add to, to this construction um, when it is uh, implemented with uh, quantum circuits? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to say. Uh, uh, this uh, bipartite expander is quite uh, it's quite inefficient, uh, but we only make a uh, black box use of this um, this uh, bipartite graph. So uh, any efficient construction uh, can be just plugged into our construction to make uh, make it efficient or 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 practical. Yeah, uh, but uh, I also want to mention that uh, our construction is not based on GGM tree based construction. So our PRF don't need to evaluate each uh, large domain PRG every time. So 
Right. Okay. Thanks. So you provide. Uh, I can ask one more question. So you provide the ge generic transforms from a, a post a post quantum PIF to a quantum secure PIF, right? By adding another layer of like this uh, bipartite uh, uh, expander. So what? So uh, how how it, uh, how how does your construction compare with other quantum PIFs in terms of uh, efficiency or overhead? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's that's a good question because uh, we also we also face these uh these reviews uh during our reviewing. Uh, so so um. Current, current no uh, quantum secure PRF are just based on a uh, language paper. He gives uh, proofs for uh, those those uh, functions, but this uh this PR this PR uh, QPRFs are um some of them are, are based on uh GM tree based construction. So uh, every time you had to evaluate a large domain PRG every time, but our control we, we don't we only need to do a small domain PRF. So uh, this would be um uh this would make our construction more efficient and also uh, our construction can can be done sequentially so which means we can use less uh, less more qubits uh, during construction yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. okay great um thanks a lot sehan yeah so uh, thanks thank you Okay, uh, let's move to the third talk, which is um, improved classical and quantum algorithms for subset sum by Xavier Bontain, Lemi Bricor, Andre Schlottenwacher, and Imin Shen. So um, Imin is our speaker. Um, hi, yeah, so, so my name is Yixin Shen. I, I'll be talking about uh, Improve the classical and quantum algorithms for uh, subset sum. Oh, sorry, wait. Uh, so the subset sum problem is the following: we are given n integers um, a one, a two until a n, and the target s, and we want to find a subset of these integers which sums to uh, the target s, and the subset can be represented by a vector e, where, which uh, has coefficients in 0, 1, where each ei represents uh, whether the corresponding ai is equal to, is inside the subset or not. And uh, in cryptography, we are, uh, so this problem is, uh, is known to be uh, NP complete for the decision version. And uh, in cryptography, we are more interested in random uh, instances. Mm -hmm. So in our paper, we studied the random subset sum problem. And um, in particular, we studied the, the density, case, uh, density equals one case, which is the hardest, meaning that here uh, the, the AI and the, the S are chosen uniformly at random from Z over two, and two to the power N Z. And what we know previously is that uh, all classical and quantum algorithms all run in exponential time. And in our paper, we try to optimize the time exponent beta. So the subset sum problem is quite important for cryptography because it is used as a hard problem for post-quantum uh, uh, encryption scheme, although it is mostly of uh, only of uh, uh, theor theoretical interest. Uh, furthermore, similar techniques uh, also apply to other problems such as generic decoding algorithms. And uh, solving subset sum problem is also useful in, in Regev's version of uh, quantum hidden shift algorithm. It, it, it can actually be, be seen as a subroutine. And the uh, quantum hidden shift algorithm is used uh, to, to do uh, isogeny based uh, cryptanalysis. So our first result is uh, is a better classical algorithm, and uh, we we obtain the exponent zero point two eight three by using uh, more coefficients in the representation technique, and uh, it's not a very huge improve improvement compared to the previous results. Uh, but our main contribution is uh, about quantum algorithms. Before I can present it to you. Uh, I need to talk more about the uh, quantum memory models. So uh, usually in order to get uh, quantum speed up, we need to 
be able to read uh, the data in a superposition way. Uh, but uh, we may or may not assume um, uh, uh, to be able to write also in a quantum in a superposition way. So there are actually two uh, two different uh, quantum memory models, and one is called um, quantum memory with quantum random access. And uh, all previous quantum subsets and algorithms are in this model. But uh, this model is uh, actually not considered uh, realistic yet. Uh, what is more realistic is the classical memory with quantum random access model, where only classical write is allowed. So uh, we are able to obtain uh, the first uh, quantum algorithm for the subsystem problem in this classical memory with quantum random access model. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so this is what we achieved. Uh, we obtained this exponent 0 0.2356 uh, using this weaker memory model. And it is comparable to the previous state of, of the art uh, algorithms uh, with this, hard, uh, this stronger model. Uh, furthermore, they used a conjecture on the quantum work update step. So it is quite reassuring to see that we actually don't need this stronger model. And uh, in our paper, we also obtained um, uh, uh, we opt also obtained better quantum algorithms in the stronger model, and we actually have two variants of it. Uh, one is um, one without this uh, conjecture, and one one with this conjecture. And furthermore, we actually we were able to remove the conjecture in all the previous uh, quantum algorithms. Uh, but uh, we were not able to do it completely in our best uh, algorithm. So this is all what I want to talk about and thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. So uh, any question from, uh, from audiences? Okay, here's one question. Um, uh, very nice work about the classical algorithm, yeah. do you think that adding more representations can further reduce the time complexity or is there some kind of uh, convergence? Uh, yeah, I think um, we, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, there will be some smaller and smaller improvements and in the end it will converge, but, uh, uh, but uh, and since we'll, if we add more, uh, more uh, coefficients then, uh, uh, like there are more variables in our in our programs, and uh, it, it's hard to to obtain the it's harder and harder to obtain the the, the best uh, exponent. So we just stopped at uh, at two, and uh, yeah. So I, I think in the end it will converge, but uh, we don't know how far it will it will go. Yeah. Okay. So um, also there is uh, another question. Um, the set minus one zero one two yeah you use uh, use is a little strange i think huh. have you ever tried others like minus two minus one zero one two which is uh, symmetric yeah it, it's quite related to the previous question we we actually tried but uh, we since there are too too many variables and uh, we were not able to to our optimizer were not able to converge so so yeah, we didn't get a better exponent, but uh, yeah, definitely if you have minus two, then it will get a better, you will get a better exponent, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, one question, can you, do you mention anything about the memory complexity with your algorithm? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, in our paper, we mentioned it and most our, uh, uh, algorithms, their memory complexity is equal to the the the, the size of the uh, the the biggest list in our merging tree. Yeah, except for the I think except for yeah, I don't remember correctly, but it's the case for the the um, most part of the algorithms. Yes. How do you compare it with the previous uh, algorithms? Um, it's better, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, no more questions? No, no. 
thanks a lot Thank for, the, for the good talk. So our next talk, the fourth talk, will be uh, security limitations of a classical client delegated quantum computing by Christian Bradich, Alexandru Kojukaru, Leo Kulizon, Ilan Kashafi, Dominic Leiker, Atu Metro and uh, Petros Warder. And the Leo Kulizon will give the talk. Uh, hello, you can hear me? Yes. Thanks. Okay. So thanks sure. a lot for the introduction. And I'm going to present our paper, Security Limitation of Classical Client Delegated Quantum Computing, which is a joint work with Christian, Alexandru, Elam, Dominic, Atul, and Petros. So uh, long story short, we have a classical computer, uh, classical client, Alice, that would like to perform some quantum computation using a quantum sub. So of course, could directly send the computation, but Alice would like to make sure that Bob doesn't learn the computation she's doing. So we would like Bob to be blind with respect to the computation that Alice is doing. We know that it is possible to achieve such delegation using the universal blind quantum computing protocol, UBTC for short. But the problem of that protocol is that it requires a quantum link between Alice and Bob. So in order to mitigate these issues, several protocols and these has been introduced. They are known as remote state preparation protocols and they just classically simulate the quantum channel. So in this work, we try to answer to the question, is it possible to securely use these sub protocols into bigger uh, protocols? So first, let me talk about the different security models. So we have uh, three models of security that we consider. So the simple model of security is game-based security. So in this model, the proof are easy to write, but we don't have strong guarantees on security. On the other side, we have general composable frameworks. In these frameworks, the proof of very strong security guarantee, including under composition, but the proof are usually harder to write and sometimes it's possible. So in this work, we will use the abstract cryptography framework. So what is uh, composability? So usually we have what we call uh, ideal resources, or sometimes it's called ideal uh, uh, functionalities that are trivially secure, and uh, in the sense that they are information theoretically secure. So we, it will be the definition of our security. And in practice, we want to realize that ideal resources using some weaker resource. So uh, the final protocol that we obtain is usually uh, computationally secure. So to give a simple example, we can consider a channel between two parties, Alice and Bob, with a potentially malicious if they are try, trying to run the message. So you can see that this resource leaks at least the size of the message, and therefore it is uh, information theoretically secure. Now in practice, we have a protocol that will leak uh, some encryption, for example, and we need to compare how this protocol relates with the ID resource. So we use for that a distinguisher, and the only role of the distinguisher is to try uh, to distinguish whether it is interacting with a class, with the ideal world or with the real world. So we can see that here it is pretty easy to distinguish the carrot uh, recorder from a wooden recorder. So it means that it won't be very secure. Uh, note that the distinguisher must be uh, usually uh, computationally bonded, and that way it uh, allows us to link a uh, computationally secure resource with an information theoretically secure resource. Uh, okay, so our first results state that it is impossible to uh, securely, uh, to prove the security of classical client RSP protocol in a composable manner. So first, what do I mean by RSP uh, resource? So we say that a resource is an RSP resource if after an honest interaction, Bob will come up with a quantum state and Alice will get the classical description of that quantum state. So note that this uh, property just characterizes correctness. On the other side, we have describability. So uh, the notion of describability uh, is an information theoretical core notion. And we say that a resource is uh, describable if there exists an unbounded uh, adversary that can extract the classical description of Alice given access to only Bob's interface. So to give an example, uh, we can consider the resource uh, that sends a quantum state, so a qubit, uh, for example, a plus theta, which is the one used in UBPC protocols, and uh, that leaks on the other side, the theta corresponding to this plus theta. So you can see that this resource here is not describable, because if you can extract the theta given access only to this uh, plus theta, then you would violate the no-cloning principle. 
So usually this probability is not a wanted feature. And what we prove is that any RSP uh, resource must be describable. So we link this uh, uh, computational notion with a uh, notion of uh, uh, describability. And because we would like uh, usually our resource not to be describable, it means that as soon as our resource are uh, information physically secure, then we cannot find any classical client RSP protocol that realize this resource. So as a corollary, we can show that all useful resources are impossible to classically realize. Uh, and the proof just using some classical simulation tricks. Okay, so our results show that it is not possible to have RSP uh, composable resources, but maybe we can use uh, some classical protocol into bigger protocol, uh, like the universal blend quantum computing protocol, and make sure that this new protocol is still secure. So we prove that it is also impossible to prove the security of uh, the UBC protocol in which you replace the uh, quantum communication with any uh, classical client uh, RSP protocol. So the proof uh, goes by a series of reductions that turns out at the end to violate the no signaling principle. And uh, finally, uh, our third result uh, shows that if we are happy to use game-based security instead of composability, then we can prove the security of the combination of the Q-factory protocol, which is a classical RSP protocol, with the UBTC protocol. So the take home message is if we want to target uh, composable security, then it is both impossible to prove the security of RSP and classical client UBTC protocols. But if we are happy to use game-based security, then uh, Q-factory can be securely used as a subroutine, as a subroutine, sorry, in all these protocols. So we still have a few open uh, problems on the security of standalone model and on uh, the, the security of uh, verifiable blind quantum computing protocols. So thanks for your attention. And if you want to learn more, feel free to see our video. I had a lot of fun making it. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, do we have any questions? I, I, I don't see any in the chat. Uh, Okay, so, uh, so what? So your impossibility doesn't actually uh, doesn't rule out that a, a specific ISP protocol can replace the quantum channel, right? And you find an example like this uh, universal blind uh, quantum computing right, protocol, right? Well, you mean in, composi okay. in the composable framework? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 the stand uh, the. The simulation-based uh, security, right? So, so what? what so, yeah. yeah so so what we I, didn't really check what is the. the, the so like, what I want to ask is, uh, what are the essential the difference between the, you know, the composable security and uh, I mean simulation-based security? And what what does that uh, the no guarantee no guarantee are obtained when is when composed it means that they, when if you do uh, simulation based proof right in the quantum world what that what do, you, do, you, do you, is there any essential difference in, so, you mean just, so basically this uh, simulation uh, model that you are describing in basically in between our game based model and the general composable uh, framework and we don't have yet any result on the the standalone model where we have uh, simulation so the proof doesn't directly apply, the impossibility proof that does not directly imply, uh, uh, apply, sorry, uh, because uh, we, we don't have interaction anymore between uh, an external uh, environment and uh, a local adversary. So it is for now an open question, and I, uh, I don't know yet if we can prove any no go result in that direction or not. Okay, I, I see. Thank you. So. If, uh, if we don't have any other questions, we will move on to the next talk. Uh, next talk, the fifth talk will be uh, quantum circuit implementations of AES with fewer qubits by Jian Zhou, Zhi Hao Wei, Si Wei Sun, Xi Men Liu, and Wen Ling Wu. And uh, Jian Zhou will give the talk. Can, can already start. Yeah. Please un unmute yourself. Sorry. 
Oh, I see. No. Please share the screen. Okay. So. Some problem. You can already play the slide. You know, start to. Uh, Okay. Okay. We 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 can see. You can see. You can see. You can see. Doesn't it okay? Uh, you, you need to full screen your slides. Now it's uh, oh. maybe share the okay. Play your slide. Uh, yeah, Doesn't yeah. it okay? Okay, okay. You can, can always. Uh, okay. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello everyone. I'm Jian Zhou. The title of our presentation is Quantum Circuit Implementation of AES with Few Qubit. Uh, first, I will make a brief introduction to the quantum circuit. Uh, different from the classical circuit, quantum circuit should be reversible. So, a quantum circuit should not only keep the input value x, but also need to copy the output value fx to the new qubit, uh, new qubit y. There are several ways to measure the efficiency of a quantum circuit. First, we can count the number of quantum gates. Secondly, we can compare the depth of a quantum circuit. The third measure is the number of qubits is uh, relevant to implementation today. The lower the number of qubits, the sooner the algorithm can be implemented on a real quantum computer. So the primary concern in this paper is to reduce the number of qubits in our quantum circuit of AES our contribution can be summarized as follow. Uh, firstly, we propose a input classical circuit of the inverse S box of AES, which requires a 32 classical end gate by using the tower fit technique. Uh, however, we cannot find a better classical circuit of the AES S box than the one proposed by Boya and Plata. So we just adopt near classical circuit of AES as box in our paper. Uh, in the following, we will take the classical circuit of the AES as box proposed by Boya and uh, Pelata as an example to show how to convert a classical circuit into a quantum circuit. In their work, they observe the AES as box can be divided into three parts, US, Fx and Bx. The naive way to convert the classical circuit into a quantum circuit is to introduce some new extra qubit to store all the intermediate value of Xbox. Take the US as an example. That is, we required 23 extra qubit to store all the intermediate value Yi and Ti in US. Then for Fx and Bx, we also need some new ancillary qubit to store all the intermediate value in their true function. By using this idea, we can not only to compute the output of the Xbox, but also can make sure the circuit is reversible. The drawback of this naive way is it requires too many qubit. So, our second work is we find out we can reduce the number of qubits by exploring the linear relationship between the intermediate value of the classical circuit. First, uh, the output of the Xbox can be computed by a linear combination of the 18 value from Z0 to Z17. Secondly, we ob observe the 18 value from Z zero to Z17 can, can be computed by only four intermediate value and the input message. That means we can compute the output of AES uh, Xbox with only four intermediate value and the input message. By using our new uh, observation, we can construct two different quads of quantum circuit of AES Xbox, which are depending on the output qubits are zero or not. Similar to our quantum circuit of AS Xbox, our quantum circuit of the inverse Xbox of AS 
can also be constructed with full intermediate value and no input message. Our third contribution is that we propose an input zigzag method to compute the output of AES. The previous zigzag method required at least 512 qubits, while our input zigzag method can only require 256 qubits. The core idea is that we observe every operation in AES is invertible, so we can uncompute a state from a later state, while in general, this can only be done from an early state, as shown in the figures. With the value of wrong one, then we can compute the output of the Xbox in round two by using our quantum circuit of the Xbox. Then with the value of the Xbox uh, in run two, we can remove the value of the run one by using our quantum circuit of the inverse uh, Xbox uh, as follow. Uh, then we remove the value of run one and we can compute the run three uh, in the uh, qubit of run one. Then we can repeat this operation several times to output uh, to compute the output of the AES. By using our new idea, we can construct our quantum circuit of AES as follow. Uh, Compare with the previous work, we can reduce the number of qubits of AES by more than uh, 30%. Uh, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, so I see uh, you have uh, two proposals for for computing the, uh, the proposals of quantum circuits for for this uh, AES S box. So can you talk about uh, the key difference differences between these uh, two designs? Oh, okay. Mm, we can. Uh, We can take the uh, position of uh, compute run one, uh, run five, and remove run four as an example. Uh, we designed two different kind of the quantum circuit of the AS S box because we will deal with two different cases in our quantum circuit of AES. Uh, as shown in the figures, uh, we can compute the uh, output of the X box of run one uh, uh, in a zero qub qubit. So we can use our quantum circuit of the X, uh, AS S box for the output qubit uh, is zero to deal with this case. However, we should uh, only uh, we should also to uh, compute the uh, sub kit uh, for the wrong uh, wrong fight according to the key schedule of the AS uh, one hundred and twenty eight. We can compute the sub uh, sub -keys W4I as follow. Uh, so we can obtain, that means we can obtain the W20 by exploring the following some parameter to W7. So in this case, we should use our quantum circuit of the ASS box for the output, bit, uh, output qubits are not zero. Uh, by using uh, the second uh, uh, quantum circuit of the ASS box, we do not need to uh, recompute the uh, ASS box again. Uh, so we can, re we can reduce the number of qubits and the number of toll-free gates uh, in this case. So, <laughs> so okay, thank I you. See. I see. There's also two questions. Let me uh, quickly. Uh... Uh, by Morning Wang, uh, how to decompose uh, eight by eight S box into gates? You use the tower method, tower field, or a, ge a general method? Oh, oh okay. Uh, sorry again. <laughs> how to decompose your S box into gates? You use tower field or a general generic method. It's uh, in the in the chat. You can see. Okay.
And then the other question is that uh, it's a, oh, it's oh, okay. Okay, uh, we can see in this. You can, you can. Mm. Our quantum circuit of the inverse uh, Xbox uh, can be constructed with uh, seven ancillary qubit because we sh should use uh, our quantum circuit of the inverse Xbox to remove the value of the, uh, the, the previous wrong, uh, wrong, wrong values. So, so we, our quantum circuit of the inverse Xbox will always deal with the case uh, the output qubits are not zero. So in this case, uh, we require seven ancillary qubits. Okay, so since we are running out of time, so maybe if you have a, uh, any outstanding question, you can write, you can write, reply in the chat. So we will go move on to the next talk. Due to okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so next talk will be uh, quantum collision attacks on AES like hashing with low quantum random access memories by Xiaoyang Dong, Siwei Sun, Dan Pingshi, Fei Gao, Xiaoyun Wang, and Lei Hu. Xiaoyang, Xiaoyang Dong will give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, uh, let's start. Um, this work is uh, joint work with Sui Sun, Dan Ping, Fei Gao, and uh, Xiaoyun Wang, Lei Hu. Uh, first, uh, we have to know the uh, generic uh, collision attacks. Uh, we have three settings. Uh, the first setting is that we have small quantum computers and large Q, uh, quantum random access memory. Uh, the best algorithm is achieved by BHT algorithm. This is the time and the space uh, complexity. Uh, the, second, uh, the second setting is that uh, the time and space trade-off. Suppose we have S computers. Uh, the best algorithm is achieved by parallel row algorithm. Uh, the third setting is that we have small quantum computer and large classical memory. Uh, the best algorithm is seen as algorithm. The, this is the time complexity, and the, uh, it need, uh, they need the classical memory size of 2 to n divided 5. So our attack, uh, if our attack is better than each one of the uh, generic bonds, uh, it is a, 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 an attack. Uh, so uh, Hamasada and uh, uh, Hosa Yamada and uh, Sasaki uh, first uh, give the quantum clear attacks by converting the rebound attack into a quantum one. Uh, classically, uh, we have to transverse uh, one divided PR starting point. Uh, the PR is the probability of the outbound phase um, to find the right one. To be better than birthday bound, we have to, uh, we, we have PR bigger than uh, two two minus n device two. In quantum setting, Gauss algorithm is applied to find the right one uh, with time complexity of square root of that complexity. Uh, so uh, to be better than uh, generic uh, quantum collision uh, attacks uh, such as BHT algorithm, uh, the time com complexity must be smaller than uh, two two n device three. Uh, so we get uh, the probability must be bigger than this this one. So we find uh, the probability in quantum setting is much smaller, uh, much lower uh, than the classical setting. Uh, so they claimed uh, that trios are usually in classical rebound attack may work in quantum setting. Uh, they also uh, convert the classical super S box uh, technique into quantum one. And they introduced the two approaches. The first one is to use a large Q, Q RAM to store the super S box. Uh, the second algor uh, algorithm is to use Giro algorithm to find the conforming pair by, by traversing a space of 2 to uh, 32, uh, this, this four bytes. Uh, with the complexity of 2 to uh, 16. So uh, they find a new uh, trail for rebound attack. Uh, they place the super S box 
uh, in the middle and uh, given uh, 13 and the thought, uh, they deduce the starting state, uh, starting point by accessing uh, super S box technical or applying grow algorithm. Uh, the outbound phase uh, have a probability of 2 to minus 18. So uh, they need uh, 2 to 18 uh, to get a, a pair, get a red pair that collide. Uh, they achieved two, uh, uh, two attack. The first attack needs uh, a large QRAM and the second attack uh, do need QRAM. Uh, they left an open problem that in the setting a small quantum computer of polynomial size and exponential large uh, classical memory is available, uh, that their attack is lower than the best uh, tech achieved by CNS algorithm. Uh, we can see CNS algorithm uh, can achieve uh, time complexity of this with, with some memory. As a response, we apply the non-full surprise box technique into quantum collision attacks. Uh, the non-full surprise box uh, technique is given by Sasaki, Li Wang, Sakiyama, and Ota. Uh, suppose th this is the surprise box, and given the uh, given 13 and the delta, uh, we only have to traverse the first byte of B uh, to determine a right. Uh, pair that conforming the truncated differential. Further, uh, we can also accelerate the, uh, the algorithm by Gruel algorithm. So we have a we have a new uh, trial to perform the rebound attack. In the inbound phase, uh, we solve the net full surpass box with only two to uh, one point eight, uh, and in the outbound phase. The probability is also two to minus eighteen, and we uh, so we have to uh, collect uh, two to eighty uh, starting point, but there are only two to uh, fifty six uh, thirteen and delta. So we need additional degrees of freedom. Uh, so uh, we uh, we. We need uh, we perform the clean attack using two blocks uh, by placing the rebound attack in, in the second block and uh, use this, the first block to uh, getting uh, to get additional degrees of freedom. Uh, so uh, we get better results uh, in the in this model uh, without QRAM. That uh, that is better than CNS algorithm. Uh, also, we get some results on growth toll. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, we don't seem to have any other any questions. Uh, I have a very quick question. Does the uh, does your content attack uh, apply to other hash functions like SHA two? Yes, uh, it may work uh, since the uh, the correct uh, characteristic uh, in quantum setting uh, may be different uh, from the classical setting. Uh, we may find a new uh, characteristics in uh, other hash functions that suit uh, for quantum quantum types. I see. Uh, there was another question in the chat, as you can see. What is the aim of using quantum algorithms in analyzing block ciphers? Make the trail longer or reduce the time complexity. Uh, a block ciphers. Um, this uh, our our target is on hash functions, not uh, block ciphers. Um, I think uh, uh, the aim for uh, cryptanalysis on block ciphers is to evaluate the uh, security level. Uh, in quantum world for the block ciphers. Oh, uh, um, yes. Yes. Uh, the uh, the near collision uh, is uh, can can be converted to to a collision uh, collision crypt analysis. 
uh, suppose a uh, bilinear collision. Uh, suppose we are finding a, a half a half of this uh, for collision. Uh, so the strategy uh, strategy is the same for the uh, full n bit collision. I think that that the question has been addressed. I think uh, you know this. Uh... No, this such an, this algorithm by by Brad yeah. uh, Hoyer and uh, okay. Uh, if yes. we do, do not have any other questions, that would conclude the, this this talk and this talk and also this session. Okay. All right. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you all for your attendance.